From a shy girl to a courageous queen, the Book of Esther is remarkable for two main reasons. Alongside Ruth, it is one of only two books in the Bible named after women. Additionally, like the Song of Songs, it never directly mentions the name of God. These factors often make it challenging for many to grasp its significance. Yet, the story is gripping. But why is it included in the Bible? What lessons can we glean from it? Written during the Jewish exile, Esther is one of the few books set entirely outside the Promised Land. Along with Ezekiel and Daniel, it reflects on Jewish life among non-Jews. These texts offer valuable insights into how Christians might conduct themselves within non-Christian communities. During this period, a coalition of Medes and Persians successfully overthrew Babylon. God did not compel the Jews to return to their promised land immediately. When we meet Esther, she is a young orphan taken in by her older cousin Mordecai, who lived in Susa. From Esther 2 verses 1 to 18, it's easy to see why many view her as a timid, gentle woman loved and accepted by all. The story opens with a lavish banquet in the palace of King Xerxes. In a drunken stupor, the king commanded his wife, Queen Vashti, to display her beauty before his guests. Hosting a separate banquet for the women, Vashti refused the king's humiliating demand, enraging him. After consulting his wise advisors, the king was told that Vashti's defiance would set a bad precedent for women throughout the kingdom. They advised that Vashti be removed from her position using a royal decree and that this decree be made public throughout the empire. The king promptly enacted their recommendation, issuing the decree in every region and language. Later, when Xerxes' anger had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what he had decreed. His attendants then proposed that beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Commissioners were appointed across the provinces to gather these young women into a harem in the citadel of Susa under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the women, with beauty treatments provided for them. The young woman who pleased the king would replace Vashti as queen. Among the inhabitants of the citadel of Susa was Mordecai, a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin, son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish. He had been exiled from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, also known as Esther, whom he had raised because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman was graceful and beautiful, and Mordecai adopted her as his daughter when her parents died. When the king's decree was proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and placed under Haggai's care. Esther, too, was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai. She won his favor, and he provided her with beauty treatments, special food, and seven attendants from the king's palace. He also moved her and her attendants to the best part of the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had instructed her not to. Every day, Mordecai walked near the harem courtyard to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Before a young woman could go to King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. When it was time for her to go to the king, she could take anything she wanted with her from the harem to the king's palace. She would go there in the evening and return in the morning to another part of the harem under the care of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tavath, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, 
for all his nobles and officials. He declared a holiday across all provinces and distributed gifts with royal generosity. Queen Esther was gentle, listening to those who guided her, and was very beautiful. However, she soon faced the grim truth about a man who despised her people so much that he sought to exterminate them entirely. This man wielded significant power and influence, capable of carrying out his malicious promises. Following these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt and paid homage to Haman because the king had commanded it. But Mordecai did not kneel or pay him homage. The royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore, they reported this to Haman to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither knelt nor paid him homage, he was enraged. Learning who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the Pur, that is, the Lot, was cast in Haman's presence to select a day and month. The Lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. The king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadath of the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. So, on the thirteenth day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. This ignited a fierce and bold Esther, renowned for being the courageous savior of the Jews. Initially, she was terrified, approaching the king without an invitation was forbidden and could lead to death. But her cousin reminded her that she was born for this reason. She then rose to pray and fast with determination to be part of her people's rescue. Eventually, she mustered the courage to speak for her people and use her influence positively. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, 
to show to Esther and explain it to her, and he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, there is but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer, Do not think that because you are in the king's house you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther then made her decision and ordered all the Jews to fast with her for three days. After this, she would go to the king, even though it was against the law, and she said famously, If I perish, I perish. Commenting on Esther's heroic words, Matthew Henry noted the greatness of her courage, given the clarity of the law, the uncertainty of the king's mind, and the severity he had shown to her predecessor, Vashti. Still, rather than neglect my duty to God and his people, I shall go to the king and cast myself joyfully and resolutely upon God's providence for my safety and success in these difficult times. A Christian should not have a defeatist outlook but rather an optimistic one, especially when approaching the heavenly throne to obtain grace to help in times of need. Fatalism is the wrong mindset in such situations, we can approach God with boldness and self-confidence, as the scepter of God's forgiveness was extended to us at Calvary. Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need as stated in Hebrews 4 verse 16. This comes as a surprise from someone so cautious, but because God is by her side, she found favor instead of judgment, and she saved her people in a manner that has never been forgotten. In Esther 5 verse 1, on the third day, Esther donned her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace, in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and extended the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. The king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, Esther replied, Let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. She executed her plan discreetly, so much so that Haman was unaware of her intentions until it was too late and his efforts backfired, resulting in his downfall. Esther simply invited the king and his favorite minister, Haman, to the banquet. During the meal, the king tried to discern what the queen desired, but Esther procrastinated, requesting once again that the king and Haman return the next day for another banquet. Then she would reveal her feelings. People have different ideas about why Esther planned these two banquets before making her request. Some believe she needed more time to engage with the king, having fallen out of his favor. Others think her courage failed her on both occasions. A third theory is that she wanted to create suspense and convince the king that her matter was more than a fleeting whim. Another idea is that she wanted to inflate Haman's ego and catch him off guard before exposing him as a cruel murderer. Perhaps elements of all these theories played a part in her strategy. Haman left the banquet in high spirits, filled with pride. However, he became enraged when he encountered Mordecai on his way out of the palace, but restrained himself from retaliating violently. He gathered his friends and his wife, Ziresh, and recounted all the good things that had happened to him. The only dark cloud on his horizon was that Jew, Mordecai. His wife advised him to build a gallows 22.5 meters high and then get the king's permission to hang Mordecai on it. This pleased Haman, so he built the gallows. God ensured that King Xerxes remained awake to thwart Haman's plan. 
While Haman slept, the insomniac king decided to use the time to have the chronicles of his reign read to him. The section that was read included the account of the assassination attempt that Mordecai had thwarted. Through divine providence, it was revealed that Mordecai had never been rewarded or compensated for his service. It is intriguing to consider the incredible interplay of circumstances in this story, the main plot and the underlying subplots, the gears within gears, and the layers of circumstances all woven together to serve God's grand plan. Haman probably arrived at the palace in the morning to propose Mordecai's execution, just as the king felt the desire to honor the man who had saved him from assassination. Xerxes greeted Haman with a general query, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Mistakenly believing it was his time to shine, Haman suggested an elaborate parade and honors second only to those of the king himself. The monarch then ordered Haman to hurry and bestow all these honors, not on Haman, but on Mordecai. Haman went into the city and declared that his fiercest enemy was the one the king delighted to honor. Pride always precedes a fall, and arrogance leads to ruin, as stated in Proverbs 16 verse 18. In our time, there is one whom the king delights to honor, Jesus Christ. God has decreed that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2 verse 10. After being humiliated, Haman returned home and recounted the unusual events to his family. His wife and several insightful friends recognized an omen of success for the Jews and failure for Haman. Nevertheless, it was time for Haman to hasten to Esther's banquet. In Esther 7 verses 1 to 10, the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. As they drank wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, your majesty, and if it pleases the king, grant me my life, this is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. For my people and I have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, An adversary and enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, a pole reaching to a height of fifty cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Esther was given Haman's estate, and Mordecai took over his position. Haman was no longer a threat, but his malicious plan was still in motion. Esther, once again risking her life, approached the king uninvited and pleaded with tears for her people. The king extended his golden scepter to her once more. She requested the revocation of the first decree, but according to Persian law, no edict signed and sealed by the king could be revoked. However, the king permitted Esther and Mordecai to write a counter-decree. The king's scribes were summoned, and Mordecai dictated a proclamation granting the Jews the right to defend their lives. The new law was swiftly dispatched to the farthest corners of the kingdom on royal horses. Mordecai, now in regal garments, left the palace, and the Jews were filled with joy at the sudden turn of events, while the rest of the people were filled with dread. Many Gentiles converted to Judaism, fearing the Jews. When the fateful day arrived, 
the Jews assembled in their respective cities and vanquished their enemies. Even the princes and governors aided the Jews because they feared Mordecai, the second most powerful man in the kingdom. Esther requested an additional day for the Jews in Susa to eradicate any remaining threats and demanded that the bodies of Haman's ten sons be publicly displayed. The book of Esther concludes with the exaltation of Mordecai, who, unlike many others, has no record of death in the scriptures. His story is notable for his unwavering concern for his people and his true patriotism. When elevated to the highest position under Xerxes, he used his influence to promote Israel's prosperity. In this, he mirrored Jesus, who, seated on his throne of glory, seeks not his own benefit but spends his power for the sake of his people. Every Christian should strive to be a Mordecai to the church, working for its prosperity to the best of their abilities. Some are placed in positions of wealth and influence, honoring the Lord in high places and bearing witness for Jesus before great men. Others have something even greater, intimate fellowship with the King of Kings. They should remember to pray daily for the Lord's people, who are weak, doubtful, tempted, and discouraged. The book of Esther is included in the Bible for more than just a good story. It teaches us how to be courageous in public positions. Esther is an example of obedience, humility, modesty, and loyalty. In this story, I see God working to preserve the people from whom His Son would be born. This is evident in the fasting and prayer of the people when they first learn of the wicked plan against them. It is seen in Mordecai's belief that God would save his people, even if Esther was not willing to serve as his channel. Mordecai did not explicitly mention God's name, but his incredible trust in God's sovereignty was implicit. I see this in the coincidence of events, how Mordecai had saved the king's life years before, how Xerxes had recorded it in his diary, and how he read the exact page mentioning Mordecai when he couldn't sleep. Though God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, his hand is certainly present. A scholar rightly called Esther the Romance of Providence. Both Esther and Daniel lived during the same period and faced the same exile. They were two people far from home, but God placed them in positions of power in a pagan society without compromising their principles. They made significant advancements in promoting God's kingdom. This story encourages us to advance socially and professionally as far as possible without compromising our religious convictions. God can place us in positions of influence for the good of His kingdom. We must be open to letting Him position us where we can make progress. Individuals are used by God, it takes only one person to change things completely. God uses both men and women, and we are all in exile. Christians do not belong to this world, we are misfits because our citizenship is in heaven. Our attachment to this world is being gradually removed as we prepare for our permanent residence in paradise. However, God can use people in the realms of this world, as long as they remain true to their ideals and remember who they are. God can use people willing to be promoted but not willing to be assimilated. Christians are constantly pressured to integrate to avoid persecution, and assimilation is seen as a safer alternative. There is a risk for Christians to conform their behavior to that of the general population to avoid being seen as different. But God works through unique individuals who are not afraid to stand out from the crowd. A common song sung in Sunday schools, Dare to be a Daniel, Dare to stand alone, encapsulates this idea perfectly. Both Daniel and Esther were prepared to sacrifice their lives rather than deny God or compromise their trust in Him. God has the power to preserve His people. He protected Daniel in the lion's den, just as He shielded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Through Esther, He also ensured the safety of the Jews in Susa. If one seeks to eliminate God's people, they must first contend with God. Those whom God chooses to save are secure, even if we perish for Him, we will be eternally alive. As a reminder, we can be certain that the church will exist for eternity. The world is under God's control, and the Christian gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. Both Daniel and Esther prioritize the kingdom of God above all else. 
We find this truth in their stories, revealing that God rules over all human kingdoms, exalting and humbling those in authority. God is the God of Israel, and human kings and queens reign only by His permission. He is in command. There are present human kingdoms and the future divine kingdom when God will govern the world. The kingdom of God will replace all current earthly kingdoms. It is crucial to recognize that Daniel and Esther's work is not complete. They displayed integrity while serving as leaders in a pagan empire, and as a reward, God will resurrect them to govern in his established kingdom. When Jesus returns to this earth, Esther will be with him. Therefore, we should read the Bible not just as historical content but as instruction for those we might meet someday. We will have all eternity to know these wonderful saints of God. We will reign alongside the saints of the Most High with the Son of Man on the throne. All who have proven faithful will be used again on this earth to share in the governance of Christ's kingdom. No matter how scared, timid, or ashamed we might feel, God can still use us to fulfill His grand plans and bring deliverance to others. The story of Esther takes us on a journey of courage, faith, and divine providence. It teaches us that even in the most challenging circumstances, God is always present, guiding and protecting us, even when we cannot see His hand directly. Esther's life is a testament that God can use any of us, regardless of our weaknesses and fears, to accomplish His grand purposes. Reflecting on what we have learned, we see that faith and obedience are powerful. Esther not only saved her people but also showed that true courage comes from trusting in God above all else. Her willingness to risk her life for the love of her people is a sublime example of sacrifice and devotion. May we, like Esther, be courageous in the face of challenges, trusting that God is always in control. Let us be instruments of His will, ready to act with love and justice, regardless of the circumstances. Remember, just as God used Esther to save His people, He can also use us to achieve great deeds if we are willing to trust and obey. If you wish to reconcile with our Savior Jesus Christ, having strayed from His path, or want to start a new journey toward eternal salvation, comment below, I accept you, Lord Jesus as my only insufficient Lord and Savior of my life. Until next time.